Good morning to all of you. Welcome to our services on this Sunday morning. My name is Jeff Schoen. I serve you as the Vice President for Student Life at Martin Luther College. And it is a privilege to be here with you today. Let's begin by standing and singing our first hymn. <laughs> Continue with our psalm for the day, which is Psalm number 84, and it's found on page 96 in the front portion of our hymnal.
Dear friends in Christ, today is the second last Sunday of the church year, the Sunday that's referred to as Saints Triumphant. And the triumph that we have as God's saints, that is God's believers, is not in ourselves, not in our own deeds, not in our strength, but in Christ. For Christ redeems us. He rescues us. And the day is coming when we will fully know the redemption and rescue and life we share with Christ. Our first lesson from the scriptures this Sunday morning is recorded in the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, the first six verses. Now, in this section, the Lord talks about the people of Israel and he mentions that they were enslaved in Egypt, and then they were oppressed by the nation of Assyria hundreds of years later, and then immediately after that, the Babylonians would come and crush Jerusalem and take the people away in exile. It was coming. And God, at this time, the Babylonians haven't come yet. And so the Lord is is making making the future known to them. But he also, in this chapter, is going to tell the real future, that he will deliver them, he will rescue them, even though the times are troubling. Wake, awake, clothe yourself with strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, Jerusalem, you holy city, for never again will the uncircumcised and the unclean enter you. Shake off the dust, get up and take your seat, Jerusalem. Loosen the chains from your neck, you captive daughter of Zion. Yes, this is what the Lord says. You were sold for nothing, and you will be redeemed without money. Yes, this is what the Lord God says. In the beginning, my people went down to Egypt to stay there for a while. Later, Assyria pressed them without cause. Now, what do I have here, declares the Lord. Indeed, my people have been taken away for nothing. Their rulers howl with mockery, declares the Lord. My name is continually despised all day. Therefore, my people will know my name. So on that day, they will know that I am the one, the one who is saying, here I am. This is our Old Testament lesson. Our second lesson, which also serves as the, as the sermon text for today, is recorded in Paul's letter to the Romans. And, and he has a similar message. The, the message that even though our life now is filled with trouble, the time is coming when we will be delivered. Paul writes this, For I conclude that our sufferings at the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. In fact, creation is waiting with eager longing for the sons of God to be revealed. For creation was subjected to futility, not by its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in the hope that even creation itself will be set free from slavery to corruption in order to share in the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that all of creation is groaning with birth pains right up to the present time. And not only creation, but also we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly while we eagerly await our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Indeed, it was for this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for something we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patient endurance. Our final lesson from the scriptures on this Sunday morning 
is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, the first 13 verses. And here our Lord Jesus tells the parables of the ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom so that they can enter the wedding feast. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish ones took their lamps, they did not take any oil with them, but the wise took oil in their containers with their lamps. While the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, the bridegroom! Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, because our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, No, there may not be enough for us and for you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were away buying oil, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came and said, Lord, Lord, let us in. But he answered, Amen, I tell you, I do not know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. These are our scripture readings for this Saints Triumphant Sunday. Let's continue our worship then today as we turn to our hymn of the day, number 220, or the distant mountains breaking. <laughs> Grace and peace are yours today from God our Father and from his Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who says himself, I am coming soon. God's word, as I mentioned before, 
Uh, God's word for us today is recorded in Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 18. A very beautiful section of scriptures. And I'd like to read it with you one more time. Paul writes, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will burst upon us. Indeed, all of creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration and futility, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, though in the spirit we have a foretaste of the future, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it with patient endurance. Dear friends in Christ Jesus, are you familiar with the Minnesota folk rock singer Bob Dylan? In 1989, Bob Dylan wrote a song that he titled, Everything is Broken. In Dylan's observation, society was broken, and not just partially broken, but everything was broken. Religion and morality was broken. Government and the rule of law was broken. Relationships and communication broken. Everything was broken. And even though this song has a driving bass and a real tempo to it, you could not call this an upbeat song. On the contrary, it's a pretty dark song with a very dreary message. Dylan writes, there ain't no jivin', there ain't no jokin', he laments, because Everything is broken. Now the Apostle Paul wrote a song in Romans chapter 8 that far exceeds anything that Bob Dylan observed or wrote about. Paul noted that it was not only society that was broken, but everything in the whole of creation that was broken. Everything in the whole of creation is futile and useless. Everything in the whole of creation is dying. Just look around. Look around us in this world. Listen to the news. Read magazines and nature magazines. Find and examine scientific studies. What are you going to find? Everything is dying. Honeybees are dying. Ash trees are dying. Species are dying by the dozens, year after year. The rivers and the oceans are dying. The atmosphere itself is wearing out and dying. The sun is slowly dying. Even the galaxies that fill our universe we're told, are being eaten up from the inside by black holes and dying. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 that everything is broken because God broke it. Everything is futile because God subjected it to frustration and futility. Everything is dying because God imposed upon the whole of creation the curse of death 
so that the whole of creation is now chained up and bound in a dreadful slavery or bondage to death. And God did this, we're told. He brought death to his creation because the crown of his creation, the man and the woman whom he had created in his own holy image and likeness, they brought death upon themselves. They were overcome, as you well know, by evil and temptation, and they sinned against their holy, loving God, selfishly turning their backs to him, walking away from him in the absolute foolishness that they could prosper, they could live, they could, could have a life apart from the living one. And when they sinned, they died. And all of their descendants died along with them so that all of us here today, we are dead. By nature, dead in sin, dead in heart, dead in mind, dead in body and soul. You know, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier that Bob Dylan's song ended with a rather dreary message, but just think of it. What if the Apostle Paul's song to us in Romans chapter 8 had ended here with all of this dying and death? But God wrote a second verse for Paul to sing to us, a verse about freedom and about hope and about glorious life. A verse all about the love that God had, an amazing love for a sinful and dead world. A verse about our redemption in Christ Jesus, our rescue and redemption from sin and death. And this is what happened. In great and undeserved love, God the Father anointed God the Son to be the curse bearer and the death bearer. And in great and undeserved love, God the Son took on himself our human nature, our humanity, and he became our sin bearer and our death defeater. <clears throat> and in great undeserved love, God the Holy Spirit became the bearer of good news, sharing the promise of Christ with us in the scriptures and convincing our hearts that God had forgiven our sins and ended our slavery to death all through the crucified and risen Jesus. And now Paul sings, in this faith, through faith in Jesus Christ, we are the adopted sons of God, which is an old uh, Roman legal term. In essence, we are the heirs of God who will inherit a new life, a glorious life with God, a holy life, a permanent life, a joyful life, even, and Paul emphasizes this, a vigorous life in our body. Yes, in our body and soul, we will live in glorious freedom, freedom from sin and death. We will be able to live powerful, purposeful, meaningful, and effective lives because the God who is life and love enables us to live a life 
of holy love at his side. And what's more, and this is Paul's point as well, we will live this resurrection life in a restored and renewed creation. As Jesus himself describes it, a new heaven and a new earth that longs to share in our amazing freedom. My dear friends, this is what's coming. This is our future. And so we have a marvelous and wonderful hope. And this great hope in Christ makes everything, everything about this empty, painful, broken life in this broken world, our hope in Christ makes everything so insignificant that it's not worth fretting over. No, on the contrary. With our hope in Christ, we can wait. We can endure. We can be patient. Because Jesus is coming. Amen. And now the peace of God that goes beyond our understanding even. Keep your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's stand as we sing the liturgical song, We Praise You, O God. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. 
Thank you. 